Hello, everyone. We're thrilled to have you join us here at uh, World City for the first live panel session. My name is Jennifer Kiesmat, and I am an urban planner and urban designer based in the city of Toronto. And this is a truly international panel, and we'll be bringing you perspectives from around the world. We're going to be talking today about the 15 minute city, which might be or might sound from your perspective to sound to like the latest catchphrase, the latest way of talking about cities. Is it an old idea? Is it a new idea? Is it a good idea? How do we get there? How do we make 15 minute cities happen? We're going to cover all of those topics over the course of the next 45 minutes. So I'm so glad that you've joined us. You'll notice that there's a Q and A little bar on your screen, and we would be absolutely thrilled to integrate any comments that you may have into our conversation. So just throw your Q and A's into that section. We'll take a look at them. And as I am facilitating this discussion with our esteemed panelists, I will be looking at your questions and using them as a guide. We're going to kick off by hearing from each one of our three panelists a very quick snapshot of some of the biggest ideas related to the 15 minute city that they would like to introduce as we begin. We're going to hear from, uh, first we'll hear from James, then we'll hear from Peter, then we'll hear from Andre. And I'm just going to give a very quick uh, introduction to each one of them. James Rayner is, uh, he is an urban planner and a landscape architect. He's based in London and he's with MyLands Urbanism and Planning Master Team. We also have with us Peter Highland. Peter hails at the moment from Singapore, but he's actually from Australia, where he is a land strategist with Urbis in Australia. And then we also have with us Andre, Andre Brumfield. Andre is sitting today in Chicago, and Andre is the Cities and Urban Design Leader, Design Director, and Principal at his company. Uh, James, I think what we're going to do is hand it right over to you and hear your introductory comments, and then we will launch into our conversation. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. I think there's going to be yeah first first slide. So it's just um, really go fifteen minute cities. Um, as Jennifer said, is it an old or is it a new concept? I think the key aspects to this are all about an area or a neighbourhood that has easy access to services. It's about a narrative experience as well. So I've included a little mental map. Some of the plans that we do work around how people perceive perceive their neighborhoods and how they actually use the facilities um, within that. So it's about, you know, how these sort of things work in walkable streets, play zones that are accessible, open space, soft mobility, all of those things, how they come together in a really accessible way. Um, I think some of the other things we're interested in is just where 15 minute cities might go in the future. So. And this is this might be some questioning around this. So we see a few things: smart mobility. Obviously, micro mobility is going to change the shape of how our neighbourhoods work. Healthy green places. So just making sure that our neighbourhoods have great green areas to go to. Going zero carbon. That is absolutely critical. The housing. How do we make our housing adaptable so it can uh, change the way it sort of works with different families? over there over the time and how can it how can it adapt into other uses an urban heart where everything comes together maker economies where we're all working at home now remote working how does that play into 15 minute cities the other thing that we're really interested here is how you take that concept and put it into places that are growing really really far so we do a lot of work in emerging um, cities and just sort of really getting to talk to communities and really understand you know, how they can um, change, you know, places that have grown really, really fast and incorporate some of these principles into the way that they live and just working out how they how they might um, move ahead. I think the final bit is where we're all probably familiar with TOD. TOD equals 15 minute cities, probably equals pack cities. I think these are some of the things that will be really interesting to, to debate later on. So I think I'm gonna hand over to um, Peter 
So, Peter, I'll let you. I'll let you take it away. Thanks, James, and uh, good evening, everyone from um, Singapore. As Jennifer said, I'm a um, urban economist and urban planner by training. Uh, originally Australia, but I've had the privilege of calling Singapore my home for the past five years as the regional director heading up SISTRI, the international arm of, of Urbis. One of the reasons I'm talking tonight about Singapore is because it's often seen by many as a, a living laboratory or living example of many of the pr uh, principles that I think espouse what the 15-minute city is all about. You know, there is much discussion at the moment about density and livability. You know, density is being a little bit critiqued because of the pandemic and seen as an issue. But Singapore is a model for high density and high livability, and let's talk some more about that. It's also a model in terms of that long-term planning is the key. You can't just suddenly come to this area of having 15-minute cities without some planning, some initiatives, and some thinking. And Singapore is, a once again, a living laboratory of planning, strategic planning, have 50-year visions, and then revisiting and updating and integrating your planning between your, your transport, your economic planning, your land use planning. It's also about evolving over time. In 1971, Singapore was talking about highways, but you see by 1991, it was talking about mass, mass transit. By 2001, decentralisation. And this is a, a country, an island nation, which is east to west, more than 40 kilometres, and north to south, less than 30 kilometres, would fit 17 times into the area of Greater Sydney. But it's about bringing jobs closer to, to, to centres, having a polycentric approach, developing this as your principles. It's about having a transport plan, which is not car-centric, where 75% of all your journeys will be by public transport, where only 20% of households own cars. It's about having 25-minute towns where your family has access to its schools, its clinics, its shopping centres, but also recognising there is perhaps a need for a broader city policy that might envisage further trips because of a need for different types of industry, different types of employment, recognising the subtleties of that. It's about investment. You have to look at long-term investment. You have to plan for it. You have to budget for it. And then you have to deliver on it. And it's about transit-oriented development, as James said. You can't instigate much of this without good, real-life examples of transit-oriented development, which Singapore has. And developments like Kampong Admiralty, which has won World Architecture Prize, true integrated aged care, housing, commercial and transit. So Singapore is a living laboratory, and I think in our discussion we can talk about many of these principles. So thank you, and I'll now turn over to Andre. Good morning. Uh, my name is Andre Brumfield uh, with uh, uh, Gensler, Principal in Charge of Cities and Urban Design, uh, based here in Chicago. I'm uh, just struggling to get back to the beginning of my slides here. So here we go. Um, so first, I want to thank uh, World City for inviting uh, me to be part of this exciting panel with uh, my esteemed colleagues here. Uh, one thing that I wanted to at least uh, address as we talk about the 15-minute city and the 15-minute neighborhood was the ideal of equity. And of course, we know that the 15-minute neighborhood is not an, uh, a new concept, but it's not been talked about too much in terms of equity. And I think the pandemic, uh, along with the social protests and the murder of George Floyd, at least here in the United States, we've started to think about our neighborhood much differently in terms of what we're missing in terms of our assets as it relates to a 15-minute city because our cities are only as good as our neighborhoods and our neighborhoods need to be more balanced and more equitable. So these are just some initial thoughts. When we think about what's important in our neighborhoods, of course, neighborhood-based retail and commercial retail, small businesses, the future of small businesses are really one of the lifebloods in our number of our neighborhoods. So given the pandemic, once we actually get on the other side of this, how do we think about retail and small businesses and preserving that uh, in our, uh, the ideal of um, creating neighborhood-based employment centers. So this is not to suggest that the central business district should be decentralized. But if we look across the world, and Singapore is a very good example, as well as other uh, cities, how do we actually create a more polycentric city that starts to balance employment opportunities, employment bases in our neighborhoods, and have them be more localized and create new centers of excellence, if you will, and gravity uh, in our cities? The ideal of internet as a public utility, I'm facing this right now, both my, my wife and I are working from home like millions of other people across the world, but we're also learning from home as well. And a number of neighborhoods don't have access to the internet. And in my view, and I think this is widely accepted by a number of other people, how can we actually talk about creating more equity in terms of access to the internet and really talking about 
pot in terms of a public utility, just as uh, important as water, just as important as electricity, so we can all stay connected and stay, if you will, local. And of course, affordable housing and mixed income housing, uh, the idea of creating uh, opportunity for people of all ages, for all incomes, to actually be part of their neighborhood, to live in their cities, so they're not forced out uh, due to uh, increased cost of living, but also creating a balance of neighborhood, or uh, I should say, residential types. So uh, we talk about this idea that creating the missing middle uh, in a number of American cities, whether it's Denver, whether it's Dallas, uh, they've been struggling with this idea of, you know, kind of this dumbbell uh, uh, kind of housing stock as it relates to single family homes or mid-rise or high-rise buildings. And in other places like Chicago and New York, where you do have more of a low uh, to middle uh, density, you know, creating that or preserving that housing stock. So again, you can cr talk about ways or different ways to create a broad range of housing types that allow for different uh, affordable uh, uh, types to be introduced in the neighborhoods. And finally, uh, before I turn it back over to Jen, the idea of actually sharing assets across the neighborhoods. Um, so one neighborhood may have five or seven of the different food groups that are in their neighborhood, but that adjacent neighborhood may have the other three or four, if you will. So how do we actually talk about our neighborhoods as they work together and they actually take advantage of the assets across neighborhoods to create a real holistic, equitable, balanced city? So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Jen. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. Um, you know, it's so strange doing these things virtually because you have a virtual green room and you don't have that kind of dynamic that you have when you're in the room together. But some of you may have noticed that when I introduced Andre, I just forgot for a minute your company, but of course it's Gensler. So my apologies That's for doing quite that. all right. I was it's like, quite oh, all right. A little little brain drain there. Um, so I just want to point everyone out that to everyone that if you take a look in our thread, we have got uh, a truly global audience. Um, I'm proud to say from Nova Scotia to Vancouver to Montreal, welcome, uh, to Oklahoma, to Singapore. We've got some folks who are joining us. Of course, uh, we also have some people from, uh, someone from Wimbledon, London. We have a good morning from Washington, DC, which is fantastic to see. And I can't forget Calgary, Alberta. So welcome to everyone who is joining in from cities across the entire globe. Thank you for uh, the introduction from our panelists. And I think uh, one of the first things that you've probably noticed is that there's a lot of points of consensus about what a 15 minute neighborhood is. And we also know that a 15 minute neighborhood is in some ways, it's an old frame and it's a new frame. And I'll just like to talk for a second about distilling down when we talk about what the most critical and fundamental elements are of a 15 minute neighborhood, uh, the most fundamental elements, I'd like to hear from each one of the panelists, just give us three. And of course, James had a comprehensive framework. It didn't include equity, but let's hear the three. What are the three most fundamental things you need to get right uh, that are in the DNA of a 15 minute neighborhood? And then we'll talk a little bit about who's done that really well. So why don't we, uh, we can begin with anyone who'd like to go first. And Jennifer, it's James here. I, I mean, the thing that strikes me about the concept of sort of really good neighborhoods is just access to services so i think and when i think about that it's not just access to one retail service it's access to education it's access to health it's access to maybe even a place of work so that i think that's a sort of a bit of a fundamental for me so i think that's that's the essence this idea of a heart to a place is absolutely fundamental that's number one <laughs> That's number one. That's why when we begin with one big idea, I think access is a very powerful way to yeah. articulate uh, what a 15 minute neighborhood is about. I often talk about it as a counterpoint to the long commute. The long commute is the opposite yeah. when you can't access work because you have a long commute. Uh, Peter, what's what's the big idea? Yeah, I, I, I agree with James. I mean, I think it is access to those um, primary sort of um, activities that you as a a person, whether you a sole household, if you live al alone, and I think we've got to look at it as a range of households from the people who, who live alone to people who live as a couple, who live as a family, whatever form that sort of takes, that if your household is yourself, that you can have access within 15 minutes to your shopping needs, 
a form of your cultural needs, your community needs, ideally access to your work needs, but if not access to a means to get safely to your work needs in a safe and efficient manner as well. So I think it's providing that environment where your immediate needs can be satisfied. If it's a family, ideally that it's access to your schooling within that period of time, particularly to the you know, younger schooling, the elementary schooling has access so it's walkable for your schooling uh, areas. And I, I think as, as well, another idea I'd put there is that it, I also have this, not belief, but I think it's important to frame safety, but it's a, it's a framework within which you feel safe, that you can explore, move in with what you feel is a safe environment. So I think safety is a very important sort of consideration or um, uh, uh, overview of what is a, a 15 minute in, um, neighborhood. Andre, you do you want to build on that? Yes, you know, it's, it's this is almost a very easy, but at the same time, very tough question to answer, you know, because I, I think what's uh, good about uh, us uh, and the larger conversation around 15 minute neighborhoods is actually it's forcing us to rethink what this really means. And uh, I think uh, James and Peter hit on and kind of stole one of my headlines in terms of access. I guess if I were to add another word, it would probably be balanced, right? You know, and how can we create a more balanced city and a more balanced series of neighborhoods? that not only gives people uh, of all ages and all the incomes access to all those assets that they need in their neighborhoods, but I think also uh, just as important, if we think about public transportation, uh, the idea that we all have to think about beyond where we are today in this uh, moment in time, the pandemic, we will get through this, we will come on the other side of this. And what I think is great to look around the world and how you still see cities and governments investing in public transportation, I think that's something that we clearly need to do here in the States to know that it's still very much important and critical more than, so than ever to think three or five years down the line and the importance of uh, uh, public transportation because that's where access comes in and that's where some elements of balance can actually come in as well. So very interesting, large consensus around this idea of access. Um, I'm surprised because no one said, and it might be linked to access, but no one used the word scale. But when I think about 15 minute neighborhoods, I think about the scale at which we plan. And that means not just the neighborhood scale, but it also means having clarity about, to the point you raised, Andre, what's shared in an adjacent neighborhood, but then really critical, what happens at the scale of public transit? You're not going to have a university in every neighborhood, but you might think really strategically about having a mix of uses and access to education, and then public transit becomes the, the link. So I tend to think about getting the 15-minute neighborhood is actually planning at a very different scale than, let's say, suburban sprawl, which is about planning at the scale of a car. It's planning at a, at, at a very different scale. The other key word, and I'd like everyone to just comment on this word and concept, and in part because I think it's an idea that has been lost, that has been regained when we talk about transit-oriented neighborhoods and when we talk about um, walkable neighborhoods, is the idea of proximity. And proximity being something that can happen through walking and cycling. Could everyone just comment a little bit on the idea of proximity and how it fits with the 15 minute neighborhood. Andre, why don't we start with you on this one? Well, you know, I think, you know, the idea of proximity and access, you know, as we talked about uh, are key, you know, and actually I kind of like to just take this, uh, twist this just a little bit uh, beyond what you said, because I think there was one thing that was important that you mentioned. And it's one thing that I talked about in uh, my series of slides is uh, the idea of retail and mixed use. And I think this is an opportunity to rethink what mixed use really means uh, and you talk about scale you know that ground floor doesn't necessarily have to be a cafe or shop right if we think about you know the other uses in terms of commercial activity or health care health and wellness that we can actually talk about uh, I think those uses and think about mixed use in a different way is critical so I just wanted to get that uh, make that mention but I think in terms of scale um, you know it's been interesting uh, uh, as we were talking about prior to uh, this session you know the world has changed at least two or three times in the last uh, six to seven or eight months. And, you know, uh, six months ago, people were calling for the death of cities. And the culprit of uh, the city was density, 
to your point. So in terms of, you know, the things that we as urban designers uh, uh, hold on to and planners is that density is important. Proximity to density is important. What kind of density we're talking about in our neighborhoods and our cities are very important. I think this is a good way for us to kind of rethink what that really means and how important it is to having a vibrant city and a vibrant neighborhood. I think my time may be up, so I'll, I'll let my colleagues uh, speak here. So. Well, and we have a comment here, which I think is really relevant, which is that um, to the point that you're making is that we, when we shifted away to big box retail, it actually sh that was part of the driver behind shifting away from having uh, walkable neighborhoods. And it was, you know, the, the, the approach to retail is fundamental to whether we deliver on the promise of getting of getting the scale right. Uh, James or Peter, did you want to pick up on this idea? Yeah, and I think it's really, really interesting. I think one of the consequences of the past months is what I think is a really big rethink and re and in a in a way I think we're much we're much more open now to the idea of repurposing some of these assets that have actually, you know, been a, a been a problem you know we've 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 all driven to them and, the, and they have they you know they have had their time but i think what's really interesting now is this idea of taking some of those big boxes and repurposing them into much more interesting dynamic mixed use locations and you know i think that's that's a very interesting concept they, they may actually be a bit of a catalyst now for for new for new sort of 15 minute cities if we can get it right that is that's the challenge and i i, I think jennifer just building on that your point about proximity is is very apt and um i think particularly once again using singapore as an example because singapore is a very car light city as people are aware as i said less than 20 percent of households without cars which compared to most developed you know, cities in the world where 90% of households have at least one car and 60% you know, of households have two cars. So if you remove the car dependency, the proximity, the, the need to be able to use either walk or to sort of cycle or to use efficient public transport to get to your shopping needs, your needs, you get much more a better scale of evolution of your, your centres and a much more sort of... Um, uh, less um, car dominated sort of environment. So I, I think that, you know, if the, uh, you know, and Singapore's obviously a, a highly developed city now, but as an example for cities around the world to remove that car dependency even further, then the sense of proximity is both actual and also uh, mentally perceived as well. So mm -hmm. let's shift for a minute here and talk about, um, and I, I do want, we're, we're going to talk next about the how, and I think Peter hinted at this in his presentation by talking about the long, the long term, you don't snap your fingers and you've got a, um, a 15 minute neighborhood. But before we do that, let's talk about some of the best, some of our favorite 15 minute neighborhoods and a personal question to begin. Do you live in a 15 minute neighborhood? Um, I live in a 15 minute neighborhood and it means that uh, when I moved to where I live now in Midtown in Toronto, uh, we were able to sell our car. Um, we were able to, I changed where I get my hair cut. I changed our dentist. I changed our doctor uh, so that everyone could be, all of the services that we need for everyday life could be within five minutes of my home. And for me as a as a mother who had a very busy job that was just trying to manage uh, our everyday life came down to having things in close proximity. And I said to my kids, they could only do extracurricular activities that were in the neighborhood. Um, so living in a neighborhood rich with extracurricular activities was critical because I wasn't going to be mom's taxi driving people around or schlepping <laughs> them around the city. Um, so I have a question for each one of you. First of all, uh, so my my favorite 15 minute neighborhood is the one I live in, but I can name many in Toronto and many around the world. Tell me, do you live in a 15 minute neighborhood? If you do, how has it changed your life? What do you love about it? And then secondly, what's your favorite uh, 15 minute neighborhood? And why don't we begin with you, Andre? 
Oh, uh, you know, uh, I can go on for for the next hour on this. You know, my wife and I, my family and I, we're very blessed uh, to uh, live in a 15 minute neighborhood uh, here on the south side of Chicago. For those of you f are familiar with Chicago, uh, we live in High Park. Uh, that's where the University of Chicago is. Uh, we're blocks away from the lake, uh, 18 miles of lakefront where we can bike, we can walk, we can recreate. Uh, we're just minutes away from some of our favorite restaurants. Uh, we have uh, two grocery stores uh, that are uh, about five minutes away from our front door. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a number of modes of transportation, whether it's bus or train, both regional and across the city, that can get us to other cities and other parts of the, uh, of, uh, of the city. Uh, easy 20-minute commute downtown, uh, easy commute uh, coming back. Uh, uh, we couldn't have asked for anything more. And also, one thing I wanted to mention is that one of the reasons why my wife and I uh, decided to lay anchor here in this neighborhood for the past 18 years is that it's racially mixed. And it's also mixed in terms of age, and it also has uh, a balance of incomes as well. So uh, uh, it, we do feel that we are uh, kind of in a little hamlet here on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and I think, you know, as we talk about this conversation, one of my missions in my career is how can we actually spread some of these assets to other parts of our city in Chicago and bring some of those other assets that are uh, not in some of our other neighborhoods across the country and across the world as well. I know there was another part to the question, but I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to speak. So that was good, though. But I think it sounds like you're living in your favorite neighborhood too. <laughs> and we're living in our favorite neighborhood, absolutely. There you go, James. Tell us. Yeah, I think um, I have discovered my 15-minute uh, neighborhood over the past uh, few months. So I live on the uh, outskirts of uh, London, and um, I think uh, I think actually this is probably a, a bit of a story that a lot of people have have actually gone out and walked into their neighbourhoods and actually discovered that they're probably a little bit more 15 minute than they first thought if they didn't drive. And that's you know I used to drive to a station, I used to um, drive to the shops, but I actually walk to the station and I walk to the shops now. And I've discovered I've actually discovered the, you know the ways of getting there. So I think you know I'm a lot more contented about where I where I where I live. I think I've actually it's been a bit of a sense of discovery. I think in you know there's many great 15 minute neighborhoods dotted across Europe. Um, you know a lot of them are used as sort of really good good examples. Um, I think one of my one of my personal favorites though is in um, Canada only because it's a project I've been involved in which is uh, East Village Regeneration Project in uh, Calgary. And I think that one has actually it's gone from sort of a plan to something on the ground, which which is quite a, you know, as a master plan, it's quite a rare experience to actually see those things transform, um, you know, so quickly. So that's that'll be my plug for um, Calgary. Fantastic. We know you live Thanks. in a fifteen-minute neighborhood, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do. I live in um, in a neighborhood in in a in a Singapore called Tanjong Pagar, just near Chinatown. A wonderful place to live. I haven't. I haven't needed a car for five years. I don't have a car. I haven't driven a car for five years. I've, I've only been in a car a couple of times since I've lived in Singapore in five years. I walk everywhere. A 10-minute walk to the office, you know, within 10 minutes, there's probably 6,000 food options to eat. There's cultural places. I can walk to galleries, to cinemas, to temples, to mosques. You know, and, and Singapore is just alive with, with neighbourhoods like this. There are within Singapore you know, a raft of... Um, a wonderful sort of uh, walkable neighbourhoods and, and townships. Um, if I couldn't live here, I'd, I love Chicago and I'd love to live where Andre lives. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful part of Chicago as, as, as well. And in my home city in Australia, I, I, my home part of is Brisbane's my home city. There's an inner city suburb called St Lucia where I uh, raised our family, which is an inner city uh, university suburb, which is a great walkable suburb as well. So, you know, it, it, it is a, a privilege. And, we take it for granted that, that it is an honor to these sorts of places. So let's let's pick up on that and flip to the conversation about how you actually like how do we get from where we are in many of our neighborhoods that are not 15 minute neighborhoods to where we need to be. And it strikes me we haven't said the magic word at all, although I think Peter probably said it at the beginning of his presentation, which is the importance of density. We've talked about mix of uses 
And mm -hmm. Andre talked about it with respect to missing middle and adding a bit more density. But Jane Jacobs often talks talked in her work about sufficient density, meaning you need enough density that you can have those amenities within walking distance of home. Let's talk about how we get from where we are today. So this is really about adaptation of many of our landscapes in our cities, how we get from where we are today to where we need to be, because I think this is really the critical question. Uh, a few of us are living the dream. A few of us can see the dream. Um, and I think I, I loved your story, James, about many people discovering their neighborhood, because I actually truly have seen that even in my neighborhood with my neighbors. And we live a stone's throw to the subway. But my neighbors, many of whom used to think I was some radical, crazy cyclist because I was always out on my bike, are suddenly cycling and they're mm -hmm. They're having an experience of our neighborhood that was always there for the taking. And now, because of COVID, they've tried a different way and they've discovered that their quality of life has gone up as a result. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to just talk about this, the shift, like how do we get in places where we are today to where we need to be? And I'll open up the floor to whoever would like to um, begin with that question. Mm. Gosh, there's quite there's quite a few different aspects to that, isn't there? I think one of one of the things that um, I think the best the best sort of uh, fifty minute sort of neighbours that I've come across are, are probably ones that actually um, started you know organically, I guess, and they had they had traditionally the the sort of services and things down in a in a downtown and. They began as sort of walkable. They probably some of them have probably moved away as, as sort of driving has come has come in and destroyed some of that. But I think some of the um, city environments are, is a little bit about reclamation of of just reconnecting um, in a walkable way. You know what's all, what's already there. Um, so I think there's there's a sort of regeneration aspect that's sort of quite a soft aspect that might be just to do with really safe secure ways of just moving around your your neighborhoods i think part of that is probably what singapore has done is actually created a place where you don't have to sit in the car and i think there's a lot there's there's a lot of benefits that come from um pu pushing down sort of car car ownership and having access to other other means of moving around and i th i think James, that's a good point. But I think, Jennifer, the other point that we've just got to grapple with as well is that a lot of urban renewal um, has been sort of encapsulated by gentrification and the sort of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the desirable neighbourhoods and the sort of, uh, particularly inner city areas. And obviously, when we're talking about 15 minute um, cities and neighbourhoods, they can be, they don't have to be inner city, they can be, you know, poly area. But, um, particularly in our inner cities, I think a lot of that has been um, uh, it's seen as part of gentrification. So it hasn't been equitable in terms of access. So it's it's pushed some of the marginalised uh, sectors of our, our cities away and they've, they've gone further from the, the centre. And um, you know, having this, uh, solving that is a, a challenge. And you know, once again, as I say, yeah, Singapore can't be seen as a model for the world because it has some unique characteristics in terms of one level of, of governance. But the housing development board here that develops you know, public housing, which is sold to Singapore citizens on a long term lease so that you know, 90, 80 percent of the population are living in these very high quality, well considered developments and that the, um, the role of good and I'm probably getting a little bit off the track here, but you know, yeah, public housing, build to rent, you know, what we're seeing evolving around our, our cities in the world now. Um, I think that's also an opportunity to sort of not so much retrofit, but to ensure that we can put some of these you know, neighbourhoods back in play and bring back the mix of um, you know, incomes and socioeconomic sort of mixes back into them. Because one of the other things I think which is a characteristic of um, you know, true 15 minute um, uh, neighbourhoods and cities is is that it is diverse, you know, racially diverse, socially, economically diverse, and that's 
I, I think that's an aspiration we, we should all have in our, our cities around the world as well. Yeah, that leads kind of nicely into some of the themes that you've touched on, Andre, in your opening presentation around equity and adding affordable housing and new housing types. How, how, much, of, uh, how much does that need to be the focus to drive forward change? I, I think it needs to be not only the focus, but I think it needs to be at the center of this. And uh, I really appreciate Peter bringing up a very important point as we talk about ways that we can actually uh, bring in some of these assets, to these neighborhoods that have been underserved, so we can actually talk about them in uh, the truest sense of uh, a 15-minute city and our neighborhood and what it what it takes to get there. Uh, you know, the idea of gentrification uh, is obviously very real. I should say not only the idea, you know, gentrification itself is very real. So uh, as we start to think about uh, these uh, neighborhoods that are challenged or either uh, others that are actually on the edge, how do we actually talk about ways that we incentivize or create, you know, these opportunities for those who have actually or currently lived there for them to stay there so they can actually benefit from the change that's happening, so they can actually benefit from some of these new assets that are coming in. So, uh, Peter, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think that's very important. But I think coupled with that uh, is the idea of, I think, changing perception, uh, both on the public side and and also, uh, just as importantly, on the private side, that uh, there are neighborhoods where there is opportunity, where there's currently challenges. And how can we actually talk about different kinds of scale development that's appropriate, that allows for different developers to come in and invest in that kind of missing middle, whether it's a six flat or four flat or two flat, or that uh, investor who's a uh, uh, developer looking looking to bring in a new service in terms of health care or employment opportunities. How can we as a city and work with our city leaders and our civic leaders, you know, really put a spotlight on some of these other neighborhoods where there is opportunity? And how do we actually create change, again, where those people who are currently live there are benefiting from those new assets coming in, but then still also allowing for room for those neighborhoods to grow where we can attract other people to create a more balanced uh, community? So I really liked in the beginning of your presentation talking about the the question of looking at neighborhoods and figuring out what the asset gaps are. And it strikes me that that's a really critical part of the starting point for how you transform a neighborhood is figuring out, well, what are the assets that don't exist here that mean you have to leave the neighborhood for, for everyday life? Um, but I think there's a bit of a theme emerging here, which is very interesting, which is that there's kind of a governance question as well. Like, who are the organizations? Um, there's a question in the thread about what type of neighborhood organizations are well placed to encourage 15 minute neighborhoods. So, on the one hand, there's the design questions and the design attributes. Like, if you don't have wide enough sidewalks and you don't have access to the the scale of citywide network transit, that's going to be a problem. But then there's also the question of, um, you know, how do you transition retail in a neighborhood? And how do you add how do you add retail in a neighborhood? And I think this is going to be a bigger theme than ever in our urban planning. Absolutely. How do we, you know, a lot of, we're seeing in Toronto, um, a lot of small shops and restaurants are disappearing because they're not going to survive COVID. Well, that has an implication on the 15 minute neighborhood because it means you can't walk to neighborhood uh, resources. I'm wondering um, about the question of really, I think this question of really getting again to the how um, of community participation and community building community resilience. And it seems to me that having a clear vision of the opportunity of a 15 minute neighbor ha neighborhood has to come first. Like people have to see that there's a value in it that has to come first. And I don't know that we're there yet. Um, I think people who value 15 minute neighborhoods today tend to be people who live in them. And the dream is something that's really intangible if you don't live in a 15 minute neighborhood. On the how side, I'm just wondering if any of you can speak to this question of working with neighborhoods to deliver a different kind of vision and a different opportunity um, for access to housing, for access to retail, for not being stuck in the long commute. And we know in the Toronto context, for example, that um, you know the, the, low, the more low income you are, the more racialized you are, the odds are you're going to have a longer commute, that those two things are tied. And so linking local employment 
um, and low income employment um, to local neighborhood resources seems to be really critical. I'm wondering if anyone can speak to that question of kind of what about the existing neighborhoods that we're talking about adapting and how you begin to advance that kind of change? If I could just jump in very quickly, because I know all of us have I, one thing I wanted to point out, and I'm glad you brought this up, was uh, the idea of the community and the voice of the community. Um, I'm a firm believer as an urban designer and planner that the best ideas do come from the neighborhoods and those residents who are actually living there. And there's not a project that we take on when we're doing neighborhood revitalization where we're not trying to capture that voice and tease that voice out from the community because at the end of the day, in the beginning of it, it's their community. And they know best what the deficiencies are. Uh, and they know best, at, at least in terms of uh, uh, trying to find ways to create a roadmap to where they want to go. So, you know, I see us as just tools to really kind of help, you know, build on the foundations of what they're trying to uh, it's not only aspire to but where we try to get to so I just want to make that 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 quick point uh, that the voice of the community is critical and quite frankly change really starts there because it is their neighborhood it is their community and they know it better than we do as even practitioners I think I think it's I think Andre it's a really good point I think a lot of the work that probably we all do is around the uh, capacity building of, of the sort of communities we go in and it's very much about um, I think providing, you know, as a sort of one is the listing bit. And one one of the things that as practitioners, I think we all do is try to demonstrate what best practice is and what potential is. So I think a lot of the work that we do is a sort of balance between the two, is at the very early stages picking up on the threads of what community wants, but also demonstrating what potential might look like as well. And is, you know, as we you know, we work in that amazing 3D visualization environment where we have that ability to actually sort of you know sketch and draw in front of people what these places might be. And I think that is a that is a, a massive uh, can have a massive impact on actually giving communities an idea of what they what they what they could aspire to. And I think that's a that's a simple instrument, very and quite quite a simple one, but a very a very sort of key key one that has to be at the very beginning of a of a sort of project absolutely and i think just leading on from that and i know jennifer it's an area that you're very involved and passionate in there's the building on from what andre and uh, james have been talking about is is the evolution of placemaking and sort of the the role of community and sort of um grassroots placemaking and um, it's something which in singapore is is looking it's an area where singapore is looking to the rest of the world in terms of how to sort of um, put in play placemaking to get community sort of engaged and active and i think there's some of the very talented people from ura on this watching here tonight from the urban redevelopment authority here who are leading some of this placemaking in in singapore to get community activation um, both community and also business leading on from your point about if the the shop owner the person who owns the the shop that is now vacant because the, the business hasn't survived, what do they need to do? It's a, I think it's going to be the next next generation of the of the bids of the business improvement districts. I think we're going to see you know, bids sort of almost evolve further into a, a broader sort of community you know, basis, which may be part of a catalyst also for the, the 15 minute you know, neighbourhood, a, a broader uh, devolution of that sort of philosophy. Yeah. So what else? Go ahead, James. No, I was going to say we're right now we're working on a really interesting project in Surabaya in Indonesia, and a lot of that is around sort of mi micro um, stakeholder engagement. But it ha what it has done is is been around them, the community evolving a an identity of what their neighbourhood could be, and how and and then it's led into really interesting sort of micro projects that are maybe about public open space or maybe about um, some of the sort of small uh, maker industries they have like in textiles and things like that. And it's gradually sort of being able to draw them, draw these things together under an identity that didn't actually exist. They were there, but it's started to create this really strong community um, feel to the, to the place in quite, in quite a challenging environment. And I think it's great great actually to see some of that some of that sort of hap happening and, and you know being being you know acting as a catalyst in that 
So I'd like to just wrap up with a little bit of a rapid fire round. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions and you can just give a one sentence, very quick answer. Uh, the first one, a question from Richard in the thread. Uh, does a 15 minute city mean no autos, Peter? No, no dominance by the auto. Okay. And for you, Andre, how important is zoning? So the opposite of the community level, meaning the regulatory level, how important is zoning to changing our cities to 15 minute neighborhoods? I, th I also think that's a critical uh, piece of this as well. And I think, you know, the idea at the end of the day, what we want is to create flexibility for our neighborhoods and the flexibility for our neighborhoods to change. And I think, you know, uh, the role where city government plays in this in terms of uh, how zoning is looked like uh, or actually could uh, be approached is very critical. Uh, just one last plug I want to put in for the city of Minneapolis. If you look at what they did uh, in basically changing or eliminating uh, single family zoning, it's created a broad range of flexibility now for not only developers but other uses to come into neighborhoods that weren't traditionally there and it definitely will speak to affordability it definitely will speak to ways you can track different kinds of development you know i think if we start looking at other ways the way that minneapolis has done and other cities are looking to do to create that maximum flexibility in zoning i think that's absolutely critical in terms of what it means to the future of our neighborhoods great and james is the 15 minute neighborhood any different from transit oriented development or is it the same thing? Uh, great, great question. Um, I mean, I, I think from my, from my point of view, it's probably, uh, it's a nice, it's a, probably a nicer term than uh, transit oriented development. So I think it really is. I think a lot of the things that we've, we've been talking about today, you know, the walk, walkable cities, compact cities, polycentric cities, they, they, they're all ultimately talking about basic good planning principles. And, you know, I think, I think that's, 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 you know, yeah, I would, I would say that TOD equals 15 minute city. But there is an interesting question around density, of course, in there as well. Andre, is a 15 minute neighborhood an old idea or a new idea? Uh, it is definitely not a new idea, but I think, you know, if anything has taught us over the past uh, nine months, and I think you mentioned this as well, we've all been forced to uh, look at our, our neighborhoods and where we live and our immediate environment in a much different way. So I think it's, you know, kind of stretching our ability to think about what those concepts were in the past, and more importantly, how do we th actually think about it in terms of our neighborhoods moving toward the future once we actually get through and get on the other side of this pandemic. And um, I'm also going to uh, just close with a last question um, and I'm going to direct it to you as well, Andre, and it's <laughs> this. Um, what should our great hope be around 15 minute neighborhoods? Oh, that's a tough question, and you actually pointed it toward me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'll point it towards everyone. Well, yeah. <laughs> well I, I, I guess uh, the, the great hope is really about, um, uh, for me, it's two words. It's partnerships and collaboration. And, you know, I talked about the idea of the public and private sector, uh, but mm -hmm. there's a role where the community plays in this as well. There's a huge role where nonprofit organizations play in this as well. How can we actually think differently about our cities and our neighborhoods and work collaboratively to create not only change, but bring about a different way of how we want our cities to operate holistically? That's great. Um, I you know, Jennifer, I'll, I could just say, I would ahead. hope that it becomes, I would hope that it becomes the, the reference point or the aspiration or the planning parameter so that by which we use our framework and overlay and say, well, it, does it fit the guidelines or how, how does this relate to a, a 15 minutes or a city? So it's a, it's a reference point for, for our basic planning. So a reference point. James, do you, you should weigh in too. <laughs> and then we'll yeah, well, no, I mean, I'm, I think I agree, I agree with both Peter and Andre, I think. Um, Having a having a good planning framework, but it has to have some adaptability to it. I mean, I think you know zoning yeah. and codes can be a real can be a real um, uh, wall against against change. So when we when we talk about zoning, we're actually talking about smart smart flexible zoning. Um, I think the investment instruments that are that are used. So being innovative around how you attract um, investment and how public 
authorities use their investment because sometimes they get very misdirected in terms of the sort of projects that are actually invested in it, as opposed to some things that could really make make change. And I think there's there's just that combination of you know being being quite um, bespoke and specific to and listening to what communities actually actually a very basic thing well you know it's interesting to hear how all of you approach it because i think that all of us come from a very similar disciplinary training and we all put a little bit of a different a different twist on this when i think of the great hope of the 15 minute neighborhood i think of all those things um that it can be a frame and a tool that it can act like a vision in some ways yeah. but i immediately also go to the outcome i think about the opportunity for how we live in the future and that immediately leads me to the greatest crises of our time, which is a crisis of inclusion and creating cities where everyone has a place, where everyone has mm -hmm. access to the housing that they need, where children are safe, where people can thrive instead of being stuck on hours and hours uh, of transit or hours and hours in a car. I, I feel the, the weight of these things that have really been mistakes of the past 50 years can come together in a transformative new vision and framework through the idea of neighborhoods where we live in communities, where we have a smaller environmental footprint. I know those are outcomes, but I think they're, to me, they're what gets me excited about the 15 minute neighborhood, because I think there's so many challenges that we face today, environmental, around equity and inclusion, uh, around community and thriving, that we can actually tackle at that scale and deliver something positive and a new outcome that uh, who knows might just might just save humanity <laughs> in light of what we see today. So I wanna thank each one of you, Andre, James, Peter, it's been a delight to spend this time with you and to get to know each one of you better. And uh, hopefully we will meet in person someday. Thanks so much. Yes. For yes. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you all. Fantastic. Thank thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Peter, James, Jen, thank you. Yeah. Yes.